I've known rivers. I've known rivers ancient as the world and older than the flow of human blood in human veins. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. I bathed in the Euphrates when dawns were young. I built my hut near the Congo and it lulled me to sleep. I looked upon the Nile and raised the pyramids above it. I heard the singing of the Mississippi when Abe Lincoln went down to New Orleans. And I've seen its muddy bosom turn all golden in the sunset. I've known rivers, ancient, dusky rivers. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. Langston Hughes, 1920. I want to preview first. First, I'd like to preview the coming part of this program when Dennis will be transferring the water from the Last Bath River to the Housatonic River. The song that I want to sing now is a song that was inspired by my experience of rivers here and in Africa. A long time ago, I journeyed to Africa, to Nigeria, and on actually the, in actually the month of August, 1986, I also journeyed to Accra, Ghana, for the reinterment of Du Bois's remains. I'll talk about that more because we're trying to move this part of the program along more quickly. My first trip to Africa, I had the opportunity to wade in the Niger River and the Bani, B-A-N-I, River. I was inspired to write a song. At the time, I understood that Du Bois had named Roll, Jordan Roll, as one of the 10 master Negro spirituals or sorrow songs, he would have called them. So I used the melody of Roll, Jordan Roll to sing roll, Bonnie roll, and roll, Niger roll. I consider myself to be a song leader, which means that I greet you and welcome you and ask you for the grace of your voices as we sing roll, Bonnie roll, roll, Niger roll. I won't have to teach it to you. It is one of those songs that just comes forward as you experience it. Roll, body, roll. Roll, Niger, roll. You have to go home to Africa to see those rivers roll. Roll, body, roll. Roll, not roll. You have to go home to Africa to see those rivers roll. My mother, you ought to go there. Yes, my lord. You'll be sitting in the kingdom when those mighty rivers roll. Roll, body, roll. Roll, Niger, roll. You have to go home to Africa to see those rivers roll. My father, you ought to go there. Yes, my lord, you'll be sitting in the kingdom when those mighty rivers roll. Roll, 
vessels of life. They are like the arteries and veins in our bodies. And whether it is the Housatonic River right here, or the Bonnie and the Niger in West Africa, they are sustainers of our life. And when we get to the exchange from Africa and from, the, from America to Africa and the return. I will hope to have you join me in singing more about rivers. And I will share the story of my travel to Accra, Ghana, and on August 27, 1986, participating in the reinterment of Du Bois's remains in a specially built crypt that became what is now called the, to make sure I get the name correct, the W.E.B. Du Bois Memorial Center for Pan-African Culture and Research Institute. Thank you for your voices, and thank you for you your... You may have thought of it as a joke. And others may have expected a historical disquisition of the history of this battle. But my speech is neither of these. On the contrary, it is a bit of philosophy. A little inquiry into the meaning of life in this valley. Brought to mind because of the condition of the Housatonic River. I am not going to answer all the questions which I raise, but I do want to bring them to your minds. In the earlier days, even before this anniversary we are celebrating in Massachusetts now, this valley must have been a magnificent sight. The beautiful mountains on either side, thickly covered with massive trees, and in the midst of it, the Housatonic River, rolling in great flood, winding here and there, stretching now and then into lakes, which are present meadows, and so hurrying always on toward the sea. And I think everyone would realize, then and now, that this river was the center of the picture. In a sense, the mountains exist for the river. And no matter how much one might climb their sides, they look back upon the river as the central beauty of this panorama. Sandra Burton, in memory of Dr. Quinn Kelly. What has happened? The thing that has happened in this valley has happened in hundreds of others. The, the town, the whole valley, has turned its back upon the river. They sought to get away from it. They have neglected it. They have used it as a sewer, a drain, a place for throwing their waste and their offal. Mills, homes, and farms have poured their dirt and refuse into it. Outhouses, dung heaps have lined its banks, almost as if by miracle. Some beauty still remains in places where the river, for a moment, free of its enemies and tormentors, dark and exhausted under its tall trees, has sunk back to vestiges of its former charm. In great, slow, breathless curves and still murmurs. But for the most part, 
The Housatonic has been transformed into an ugly, disgraceful thing. We have crossed it with bridges of unbelievable ugliness. We have choked the flow of its waters. We have done this not only by filling up the river with refuse, but by denuding it of the guardian hillside trees and shutting off the brooks. Virginia Conway, in memory of Clinton AME Zion Church congregant. remember one book in particular, for indeed the whole Lusitanic was close, was close to my boyhood, boyhood days. With every real great Baritone boy, I was initiated into the mystery of water by swimming across the Big Bend. Always when I come back, here I go down to look at, but always when I come back here, I go down to look at the river in spite of the indignation and almost and almost physical nausea, which most which most of it is invariable, causes me today. And then I remember that brook. It came down from the slow sloping of western hills. It wandered miles up. Castle Hill Way, through groves of meadow, and finally Mirable D2, it went right through my front yard. That brook had everything to delight a boy's soul. Russian Falls, Crogley Marmot, placed bits of lakes on gravelly beds, trees, bushes, and little, little waterfalls. It was a complete and long, magnificent brook, and it brought its water down the hills and through the yards and across town and emptied them at last in triumph into the Housatonic. Dennis Powell for Berkshire NAACP. And then the word, world, this valley world of ours, began to throw and check the brook. I remember the angry despair of its murmurs when in that front yard they put up ugly walls to confine and half bury it. They set it under Main Street in dark, lonely culverts. They worried it and narrowed it and suppressed it and filled it up until at last it died. Like a cripple, pale and living thing, it disappeared and is not. Now what is the meaning of this? Of course, as I've said before, the thing has disappeared into a hundred places. I remember being away in Jefferson City, Missouri years ago. The magnificent wall of the river, longest in the world, which is the Missouri Mississippi, came down past the city and the city rejected it. It turned its back on it. It faced the dull dust of the prairie in its use to the Missouri for sewage and freight trains. But there came at last a man with vision. And when the new state house was built, he set its plaza right on the bluff, facing that magnificence of the river facing the whole Golden West. Since that, defendantly and evidently, the city has been trying to turn around. Kamisha Shrugs for Public History at UMass Amherst. I've just been to Harvard, celebrating a class anniversary, and when in Boston, I got lost. 
This, of course, a common occupation in Boston, but I was particularly out of patience that I should become lost on the way to Cambridge, because Cambridge, I know much better. But Cambridge deceived me on the account of the Charles River in my student days. The Charles River was nothing. It was a little lazy, neglected ditch. But only for the mockers of Cambridgeport. No real gentleman from Harvard ever paid any attention to it. Thus, very easily, I was deceived and misled because the Charles River had become a park, flanked by beautiful driveways, crossed by the arching and graceful bridges. In other words, it had taken its place as forming a natural center of beauty for Cambridge and Boston. Of course, in those college days, there were a few people on the Boston bank of the Charles who received the sunset on the waters into their backyards with a certain hospitality. But they were quite exceptional and queer, while now the whole river has come into its own. Bernard A. Drew, in memory of David Graham Dubois. One might multiply these instances. Washington has only quite recently discovered the Potomac. Pittsburgh still regards the Ohio as a canal. The Hudson is still a sewer, but the boulevards east and west are beginning to broider it. Philadelphia has found the Schuylkill and may yet discover the Delaware. Abroad, the rivers have so long been worshipped that we forget the day when the Seine was anything but the greatest central highway of Paris, and the Rhine unthought of as a story of German civilization and progress. Even where rivers have been made to slave for men and carry their burdens, Cities have learned that these hives of industry can be made also things of beauty. St. Louis, Memphis, and New Orleans are discovering this with the Mississippi. And I have stood on the park above the Niznapkapa rod and seen the panorama of the Volga. The city was torn and maimed by war and famine and civil strife, but the park and river were still beautiful. Ray Gunn, in memory of David Gunn and Elaine S. Gunn. Escorted by Will. Ray said that, I did. <laughs> the meaning of all this for Great Barrington. I conceive it a much more important matter than it may seem at first. But here is a more ordered and satisfying solution to the problem of living than in the hot and crowded and dirty city. Cities are artificial. They are nerve-wracking with noise. They manufacture their own very organization, more social problems than their ingenuity is able to settle. Here is a great country over Nine-tenths of his area is empty. And the rest, dotted by these notoriously congested centers called cities that civilization has conceived and carried on. Thank you. We'll sing on.
but is this necessary? Why can't we not, in valleys like this, have as efficient a life and surely one more gracious and satisfying? Evidently, we cannot, because no sooner does one stop here any time than one begins to feel the bonds, the frustration of effort, the impossibility of effectively carrying out of ideas and wishes and dreams. Why is this? It is impossible for us to answer this offhand. Many of the reasons are bound up with our imperfect technique of industry and communication, with matters of education and of human contact. And so we go on leaving the country and rushing to the city, raising our sons and even our daughters with no idea of keeping them home. It seems so perfectly rational to send them away to the hives of human culture. Thank you. Select Board Vice Chair Lee Davis for the Town of Great Barrington. But I wonder if one phase of our difficulty is not illustrated by our treatment of the Housatonic. We turn our backs upon the natural center of the river and try to make the center Main Street. Mr. Sinclair Lewis has proven to us that Main Street cannot be the center of real civilization. And for this valley, the river must be the center. Certainly, it is the physical center. Perhaps, in a sense, the spiritual center. You know we are judged by what we neglect. The new gown may be quite perfect but the other matters of dress betray the untrained and uncouth. Perhaps the very freeing of spirit, which will come from giving up our attempt to do the impossible, from ignoring our greatest source of beauty and completeness, and degrading it with filth and refuse. Perhaps from that very freeing of spirit will come freedoms and inspirations and aspirations, which may step towards the whole vast problem of country life and the diffusion of a diversification of culture throughout the land. Even if this vision sounds fantastic to the severely practical, certainly the cleansing of the Housatonic will mean better health, less typhoid, safer recreation, and lovelier vistas of beauty. Maddie Conaway, in, mem in memory of sisters Reverend Esther Dozier and Pearl Conaway. I have already noticed two matters which may indicate change. I'm not quite sure why the Soros High School was built upon the banks of the Housatonic. Perhaps, of course, it was simply another way of carrying out the idea that schoolhouses are to be here. In the West, one often see an imposing high school building in the main thoroughfare of the city, but not here. We made our schoolhouses in apologetic places, and perhaps that is why this school was built on the banks of the Housatonic instead of Main Street. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it may be that some thoughtful person saw far beyond the present and grasped the idea that they was putting the institution on what was the natural great highway of the valley. They may have looked forward to the time when Park and Boulevard would line the Redeeming River, when the best people 
would not attempt to climb the hills to get away from the valley, but turn about and descend to his glory, gracious habitation. When public buildings and canoes and ple pleasure boats and swimming children would make the whole valley glad and the river would come into its own again. Delano Burroughs for his unseen and unheard black ancestry. And there is a second bit that is helpful. On the steep slope of the river, in the upper part of the town, there is a house where I lived for a while with blood dripping from its windows, blood or red paint. And down back of that old house was a magnificent view vast, dark trees and pools and rocks. A few years ago, coming into town, I found that just about this mystery nook of my youth, somebody had placed a little playground, the mere shadow of a thing, so tiny that I fear children are bitten off of it. At any rate, it is usually empty. Yet that tiny bit foreshadows a whole park system. It's st strategically placed, challenging the dirt of the factory above and greeting the high shore opposite. Below it is a pool. Shirley Edgerton for Women of Color Giving Circle, Rites of Passage and Empowerment Program. beginning, we may in time clear the river, give the Searles High School its perfect setting. We may even induce the mills, if we can find out who owns them, <laughs> to stop pouring their refuse into the river, which is merely a habit and not a necessity. And so I have ventured to call the attention of the graduates of the Searles High School. This bit of philosophy of living in this valley, urging that we should rescue the Housatani and clean it as we have never in all the years thought before of cleaning it, and seek to restore its ancient beauty, making it the center of a town, of a valley, and perhaps, who knows, a new measure of civilized life. Thank you, one and all.
documented enslaved people uh, made it to uh, Jamestown, Virginia. So the year of the return was from Jamestown, Virginia into Jamestown, Accra. And when Rachel Fletcher heard that I was taking this journey, she said, wow, wouldn't it be wonderful to take something from here and maybe you can bring something from there back to here. And we can connect clearly spiritually. And so we came down here, we collected water from the Housatonic River. Uh, then we went to uh, the Du Bois grave site and collected uh, dirt from the grave site. I brought this with me to Ghana and left the dirt outside of the, his, his mausoleum. And at the same time, I collected dirt from there and brought it back. And I am today uh, going to go to the grave site and put that dirt there. But at the same time, we visited the Last Bath River, as it's called, in Ghana. And this is the actual sign as you enter the area. And I stepped down, took my shoes off, and I stepped down in the water. And I was able to gather these two little vials. And I've been safeguarding them for the last two years. Uh, in my home, I actually kept checking to make sure they weren't evaporating. <laughs> I can assure you it is the original water. And if you look really close, I was surprised as I was gathering the water, there's actually gold flakes in the bottom of this Last Bath River. And I actually captured some of them in these, in these vials. So for me, this was really a very special trip. The last bath river, uh, the Pra River descends from Ghana to the Central Highlands and flows south to the Atlantic Ocean. The river drains a lush tropical forest as it gently menders in, on its course. It empties into the Gulf of Guinea, not too far from the slave castle of Cape Coast in Imaudo, Amin. About 30 miles above Cape Coast, a tributary replenishes the Pra with cool, fresh water. It is a beautiful spot. And it is the confluence that is complicit with crimes against humanity. 
The location is known as the Slave River, the Last Bath River. The last bath enslaved Africans took on the continent before being sold to the Caribbean, the Americans, Americas, and a life of chattel slavery. In some ways, it's a familiar tale. Africans captured in the continent interior and marched to the coastal slave castles and dot the Canadian coast, that dot the, the Canadian coast. They were held in dungeons before being shipped to the new, new world. The individuals who arrived at the Slave River walked over 300 miles in shackles and chains. From the slave markets to the north. The weakened didn't even make it that far. Instead, they were thrown into the pra to drown. Here, the survivors have a brief respite from their inhumane journey and a chance to bathe in their land of birth one last time. So we are going to walk to the bridge and hopefully I will put this water into the Housatonic which to me, uh, as I hold the vials, I still think about standing down in those cool walk, running waters as it ran through my, and the energy that came from that river it wasn't just water in that river. That river was full of life, full of spirit, full of hope. And as I stood in the water, and as I stood in the cave where they were held, I said to my roommate, what this tells me is my ancestors made the journey, and now I am back home. Thank you. Like the river. <laughs> we are weaving we we two more circles. Yes, we are weaving we a two more circles. We Rango wider and wider, yes, every Rango wider and wider, every Rango wider and wider, we are sisters, brothers. Got it, you sing with me. The work that I have done, speak for me, speak for me. May the work that I have done, speak for me, speak for me. And if I fall short of my goal, someone else will take a hold. May the work that I have done, for me, for me. I'm going to do short versions of everything that I introduced, okay? Another song that I made, Pastor's Song on a Day Like Today, because Du Bois wrote the word peace with a capital P. That word, that's a dirty word nowadays. Gonna lay down my burden. 
Down by the riverside, down by the riverside, gonna lay down my burden. Down by the riverside, standing here on no more. I ain't gonna study on no more. Ain't gonna study on no more. Ain't gonna study. Turn back. 